Of all the special plants which give rise to visions and hallucinations, there is one whose very name strikes fear, henbane. Also known as the devil's weed, it has long been linked to demons, black magic and witchcraft. The next step in my quest to uncover the secrets of the sacred plants was to be the notorious henbane. Like the others I had investigated, it has been used by ancient cultures to open the gateway to a mystical world. But it can be a dark world of vivid nightmares and delirium. As a member of the nightshade family, which includes mandrake and belladonna, this plant is also a deadly poison. In my research into European prehistory at Oxford, I had come to wonder whether the effects of taking henbane might be behind the belief in magical powers of flight. To answer this question, I once again assembled a team of specialists. Over the next few days, we would conduct a series of unique experiments. Our safety precautions would be critical. Two volunteers, under close medical supervision, were to take a dose of henbane, and we were to observe the results. I've been seeing flashes on the side of my eyes, almost like there's lightning on the horizon. I seem to be losing my, my memory and concentration, so I can't really focus so clearly. I feel like I'm slurring my speech and quite dizzy. Could we shed light on the mind-altering effects of this plant? Might it explain tales of witches who go out into the night on broomsticks and possess supernatural powers? Might we be able to answer a question key to our understanding of European culture? Did witches use henbane? On the evening of the first day, my guests gathered. We were about to watch a group of modern-day witches perform a ceremony designed to induce trance. It has been claimed that medieval witchcraft was in fact a version of such ancient pagan ceremonies in which psychoactive plants may have played a central role. Come, join us in our right. Come, breathe. The group had been brought along by one of my guests, Paul Devereux. An author of several works on the cultural importance of hallucinogenic plants, he has studied extensively their possible links to witchcraft. Paul asked us to watch the ceremony closely. Bring us your blessings and protect us from harm. Also present was my next guest, historian Dr. Diane Perkis. A lecturer at the University of Reading and author of The Witch in History, she is an expert on how our cultural beliefs about witches have been created. Bring to us your illuminatory flame and protect us from all harm. My final guest was Dr. Liz Williamson from London University's School of Pharmacy. She's an expert on the medical use of drugs derived from plants, and so would be ideally placed to test whether the physical and mental effects of henbane could link with witchcraft. Come, Lou, Lord of the Summer Sabbath. Come, join us in our right. Come, come, come Lou. Lou. The group based their ceremony on the kinds of rituals that may once have taken place widely across Europe and which involve both men and women. Although little is known about these ceremonies, clues to their content can be found in 7th century Irish texts. Paul 
Devra thought that these recreated pagan rites suggested evidence for the use of mind-altering plants. So really what we've been seeing here is a whole symphony of, of trance-inducing techniques. We've seen the use of incense and um, almost certainly in many periods of time the incense would have been psychoactive. It could well have been henbane. We saw the broomstick used to sweep away the spirits, sweep the whole thing clear. And there's one school of thought that suggests that um, uh, the handle of a broom was used by witches uh, to apply um, an ointment containing mm. henbane and other nightshade mm. herbs um, to the vaginal tissues, for example. Um, quick absorption through the skin. We would be able to witness the actual effects of Henbei in the following day. But on the first night, I began by outlining the mystery of the plant's links with the supernatural. Witches, who fly on broomsticks, own black cats and engage in devil worship and satanic orgies, these images are deeply entrenched in European folklore and are still popular in films, books and on television. But it's difficult to get at the truth behind these images. Accounts of witches who claim to possess supernatural powers come from church trials of the later Middle Ages. The descriptions of flying, changing into animals and dancing with the devil come from confessions often extracted under torture during these witch hunts. However, it's been suggested that behind this satanic imagery there were indeed wise women skilled with herbs and potions and even that they were practitioners of an ancient pagan religion. It's also been suggested that the real source of their powers was their use of hallucinogenic plants like henbane which created experiences such as flying and meeting spirit powers. This would explain the strong association between henbane and other plants in the nightshade family with witchcraft in sources such as Shakespeare's plays. So the question is, could it be that the familiar images of witchcraft might be explained by the experience of taking henbane? Or are they on the other hand simply an invention of the church made up to demonize non-Christian beliefs? Soon we were to meet the volunteers who were to take Henbane in the experiment. But first I asked my guests for their initial response. Well I think on balance probably Henbane was used um, and by witches and the people that, that preceded the witches, the, the night travellers of northern Europe. It's a long tradition that goes well back well before uh, the witches that we, we are discussing. So we pick up things like the early Norse tradition of the Merc Rider, the rider in the dark, the person who would take magical potions and fly out at night, riding out into the murk of the dark. So it's pretty well established that this sort of thing did go on. But our historian Diane argued that Henbane couldn't be involved, for there were no wise women skilled in herbal potions. In fact, the witches of popular imagination never existed. Witches, I think, were ordinary old women who were disliked by their neighbours, often because they were poor and begged their neighbours for food or money. The witches that we imagine didn't even exist at the time of persecution. And if we look at this lovely early silent film, mm -hmm. this is our fantasy of witches. Diane argued that the widespread image of the flying witch, seen, for example, in the 20s classic Witchcraft Through the Ages, was entirely created by medieval superstition. A tissue of nonsense from beginning to end. So what did our expert on plant-based drugs think about henbane and witchcraft? Well, henbane has a long and honourable history as a medicinal plant, and we do know a lot about it. We know what it, is. it contains alkaloids, we know the effect of these alkaloids, and in fact, in high doses, they will cause hallucinations, delirium, loss of coordination, and amnesia afterwards. 
So these are consistent with the myths of people feeling that they're flying, um, obviously not real flying. So there's nothing there that suggests that they didn't use henbane. Mm -hmm. What I can't quite understand is why people should half poison themselves simply to have hallucinations. Well, there's, there's two sharp answers to that. People everywhere have always done so. Uh, they seek visions and they do the most ridiculous things. They can fast themselves, they can flagellate themselves, they can sit in dark places for years on end and they'll take all sorts of poisons and substances that helps them get into a visionary world. And in the sociological context of, if you like, the medieval witch, um, we have people living pretty rough, hard lives. So this was the way of going to the movies, if you like. It was an escape mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. that harshness mm -hmm. into the magical other world, into yes. the visionary world. Yes. People yes. everywhere have done it and they still try to do it. Yes. But would they try to do it with broomsticks? Paul referred to the surprising suggestion that broomsticks were used to apply hallucinogenic ointments to the genitals. Did Liz think it possible to absorb Henbane's chemicals in this way? Oh, of course, most ointments, there is penetration through the skin. Mm. And in fact, nowadays, we use this transdermal delivery system quite commonly for hormone replacement therapy patches, nicotine uh, patches. Mm. And in fact, mm -hmm. one of the tropane alkaloids, hyacine, which is known as scopolamine in the States, is used as a travel sickness drug and can be applied to the skin as a mm. patch, yeah. where it will gradually soak through the skin and have a long-term mm. effect. I entirely accept that um, psychotropic substances can be absorbed through ointments. I entirely accept that you could use a broomstick to apply them to the, the vaginal membrane. The fact that you could do so does not at all mean that people did do so. And I think much more plausibly that the image of the flying witch had much more to do with medieval Catholicism and Protestantism's ideas about what devils did. Devils are understood as people of the air, fallen angels. Devils are naturally understood as having the power of flight and so of course they grant that power to their yeah. So this is why it's so common in the, the pictures of the period, mm. uh, this image of, 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 uh, of flight, rather than reflecting any of the practices that... Uh, Absolutely. Uh, I think it must be the case that those sort of images that we have, while obviously not literally true and obviously romanticised, but must bear something to do with the tropane alkaloids that create this impression of the spirit leaving the body, of going flying out of body experience and so on, that we know that these substances like henbane can produce. And I'm sure that is... There is some evidence to support Paul's view from a 16th century physician to the Pope who records that an ointment obtained from two people accused of witchcraft actually did induce a trance state. But Diane thought that confessions of flying experiences obtained by the Inquisition were generally made up. If an inquisitor says to you, what would you sell your soul for? You're going to search your mind and think, what would I sell my, sell my soul for if you're compelled to give the answer yes because he's holding a red hot poker? Um, and, and if you do so search your mind, you're going to come up with things that are important to your culture. You're going to come red up... Red hot poker focuses the mind. Yeah. That's right, exactly. And in that sense, I agree that there may be a folkloric basis for some elements in confession. But I think that's entirely different to arguing that confession right. is an account of an yes. experience induced yes. by a drug. As the argument continued, Paul maintained that the church hid the evidence of henbane use, since this was part of the pagan beliefs it wanted to stamp out. The church deliberately repressed a reference to the use of, of henbane and other psychoactive herbs because that took away the influence of the devil to some extent. It was in their interest to satanize this practice as much as possible for their own purposes. To argue that henbane was involved but was so repressed by the church that nobody could talk about it um, I think is inherently a very weak position. Mm. Well it was talked about to some extent. In herbals but it wasn't yes. talked about on the whole by witches themselves. Yes. Is my no, point. But it, it used henbane all yes. the time because it was right. one of the most commonly used drugs and they are used as ointments because they're so poisonous. It was now time to meet the volunteers who were to take this potentially lethal plant. We were fortunate to be joined by one of the very few people who have experimented with henbane in this century, Paul Russo. He became interested in it after trying other plants in the nightshade family, which grow in his native South Africa. So I have tried henbane and some of the other plants in the same family mm -hmm. a number of times. Um, I find it um, 
very toxic and dangerous plant, but also very interesting. Some of the more memorable experiences I've had involved lycanthropy, which was the sensation of turning into an animal, um, aerial perspectives and the sensation of flying through there, seeing things from above, uh, bizarre distortions in time, where time slows down or speeds up, and then also very vivid daydreams. How does the, the sensation of becoming an animal work? What's the it took me by surprise. It wasn't something I was uh, really expecting. Um, basically, I just suddenly found myself uh, having a sensation that my hand had turned into a paw. My fingernails had grown long. They were becoming claws. I had very distinct jaw sensations. My jaw was very big, very heavy. Mm -hmm. I had uh, big teeth. I felt like I wanted to grind and rip at things. And I also found that I wanted to go down on all fours and be quite low to the ground. Oh. How about the flying? How does that it's work? It's actually quite pleasant compared to the turning into animal experience. <laughs> yes. uh, it's analogous, I suppose, to being in a hot air balloon and just sort of drifting over a landscape, looking down. It's a very smooth flight. You don't, not jerky, you don't move fast or slow. It's just very nice, comfortable drift. Our second volunteer was Australian Jim Boyd. Because the plant in its natural state is always poisonous, we had explained our safety precautions to him in detail. We had also warned him of the physical side effects to expect. So, Jim, you've now met all the people around this table, and I think what we're all wanting to ask you is, really, what's your motivation for trying something that's unpleasant and indeed potentially poisonous? Well, I'm a news journalist, and recently I did a story on a voodoo priest coming across to England to perform black magic rituals, um, which involved people entering into states of possession. Um, that really sparked my interest, and that combined with the, the spirit of scientific adventure mm -hmm. and um, doing this sort of thing in a controlled experiment r was a, a combination which um, I thought I'd volunteer for. Mm -hmm. All that remained was for me to ask my guests what tests they would be doing while the volunteers were under the influence of henbane. First of all, we're going to have a look at blood flow to see if there's any indication that it may increase genital blood flow, which would explain its use in erotic ceremonies and so forth. We'll have a look at pupil dilation in the eye um, to see if this could have a basis for the supposedly improved night vision. And we'll have a look at balance to see if a disturbance of balance could account for feelings of flying. I want to talk to them beforehand about what their idea of witchcraft is, what they think witches are, what they know about early modern witchcraft. My bet would be that their experiences will reflect what they know. Mm -hmm. And Paul, how about you? I want to hear their subjective accounts, just what has happened to them. And um, in particular, I will be interested in the flight, the question of flight because my contention is that while you're right that the actual appearance that occurs in hallucination will be culturally affected the actual basic sensation of spirit flight is cross-cultural it will occur to anybody anywhere in the world or any period of time who take these kind of substances mm -hmm. and of course in overdosage Henbane is extremely toxic um, it can lead to difficulties in urinating, flushing, delirium convulsions and even coma and death. In some accounts of henbane overdose, people have entered a death trance or coma lasting for days, during which their hallucinations take them into another world that seems completely real. So what would happen? when the volunteers took Henbane. We had gathered to try and answer a question which had puzzled me for many years. What are the hallucinogenic effects of henbane? And could they be the explanation behind witches' alleged magical powers of flying, meeting with spirits and changing into animals?
the volunteers who would be taking Henbane underwent a series of initial tests. Later, we would be looking out for signs of the active substances taking effect, such as increase in heart rate, temperature and blood flow, enlargement of the pupil, dryness of the mouth, followed by heavy sedation. The increased sensitivity to light caused by dilation of the pupil is because of a chemical in henbane called atropine. To investigate her theory that this could explain the witch's night vision, Liz was using a pupillometer, which stores images of the eye. Meanwhile, Diane was finding out what Paul and Jim knew about witchcraft. So, Jim, can you tell me, if I say the word witch to you, what, what kind of image comes to mind? Well, the first thing that comes to my mind is mad women flying around on broomsticks in communion with the devil. For Liz's next test, we had obtained a laser imager which scans the skin and produces a colour-coded picture with white and red for areas of higher blood flow through to green and blue for areas of lower blood flow. Increased body heat and blood flow to the skin is known sometimes to cause erotic dreams. We think that possibly changes in blood flow may account for some of the stories that we hear about witches, which are particularly the erotic fantasies and the fact that they may dance naked and so forth. This would be caused by an increase in temperature and possibly heart rate. Liz's tests on coordination involved a machine which senses how the body is correcting its movements in order to balance. At this point, Jim's readout was normal a random pattern of movement in all directions. Paul, if, if I say the word witch to you, what kind of image springs to mind? Unfortunately, because I saw The Wizard of Oz when I was uh, at a very impressionable young age, <laughs> it's of this uh, horrible woman with a big nose and warts on her nose and a pointy black hat and uh, things like that. Diane's interview revealed that Paul had read widely about witchcraft and was aware of historical reports of witches' trances. I'm sure the witches uh, weren't really flying. I'm sure they were pretty convinced that they were just lying there on the ground. And we had ob observers who were there and, and made notes and, and actually said to the witch, you, you didn't really fly, you've just been lying here for the last two days. So hopefully they had some sort of knowledge that it was a mental journey. By mid-afternoon, our volunteers were ready to consume the henbane. For safety, they were to take an initial dose, followed later by a second one, if all was well. The henbane had been prepared in a brew. Okay. So, the dosage had been scientifically calculated and was deliberately low. If taken in the wrong quantities, henbane is a lethal poison. So this is a, measured dose, isn't it? a doctor who specialises in cases of poisoning would be on hand throughout. For Paul, this was a tense moment. A previous experience with Datura, a plant which contains the same chemicals as henbane, had landed him in hospital. We had told Jim which symptoms should be reported immediately to the doctor. We're measuring out one uh, standard dose, so we've got a good idea of uh, contents here. Yeah, Just enough to get you flying through the air. <laughs> It smells quite nice. It smells like honey. Yeah, it's very tasty. Is this it? Yep. We're on our way. We're on our way. Chin chin. Chin chin. Then we waited. Half an hour later came the first signs of physical changes. I can feel something though. I yeah. feel my head tightening up. Yeah. Should start affecting you about that. Yeah. My head feels as if it's being... My brain feels a little bit tighter than what it yeah. should. Yeah. 
Like okay. it's one size too big for That's my one head. Of the first, first ways you'll start noticing a difference is. Do you notice that as pressure. well? Yeah, so sort of pressure. It feels like the pressure in your head's almost changing. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the first sign that it's starting to affect you. So. Something is starting to take over. I'm becoming more, uh, I suppose, aware of my general surroundings. Okay. I feel like I'm slurring my speech and quite dizzy. I feel yeah. my, I'm very flushed. I can feel my, my skin is very yeah, warm. And yeah, my ears you really are. Really are. Warm. Um, I seem to be losing my, my memory and concentration, so I can't really focus so clearly on <laughs> and things, which isn't really pleasant. The initial phase of raised temperature and mental confusion had begun. Depending on dose, henbane experiences can last between 4 and 36 hours. An hour later, the effects became more acute. Jim reported a bizarre change in his coordination. And how are you, how's walking? You, are you steady or is it okay? Well, I'm not 100%, but, but the biggest thing about it is I'm leaning forward. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not all over the place. I've got the, I'm on the balls of my feet all the time. It's almost as if I'm, I can't, I can't help being pacey. I feel, I feel as if I'm about to, um, I, I, I suppose I feel as if I'm about to lift off. Reports suggested that increasing sedation, the trance-inducing property of henbane, would follow. Although still early on in the experiment, Paul began to show signs of drowsiness. I'm feeling mainly the pharmacological effects, the dryness of the mouth, um, quite sleepy and relaxed, a little bit drowsy and so on. Um, my vision is sharper, my eyes are quite sensitive to the light and so on. Overall, quite mild experience, I would say. By now, three hours had elapsed, so discussion began about consuming the second dose. But as Liz was redoing her blood flow test, she made a worrying discovery about Jim's heart rate. Right, well your pulse has gone up to 110, which is, is fairly high, especially for somebody lying down, and it's considerably higher than it was when we started out. The henbane effects were increasing. The plant was making Jim feel relaxed and sedated, but at the same time, it was raising his heart rate too high for comfort. We were told by our specialist doctor that on no account should the second dose of henbane be consumed. However, Jim was cleared to carry on with the tests into the effects of the plant. Right, well, having a look at your, your blood flow scan, it's tremendously different to the previous one. There's been quite a dramatic increase in blood flow. We've got white areas that we didn't have before, particularly around the lips and the nose. Your cheeks and chin are all showing quite a substantial increase, and we've got red areas in places we didn't have before. So really, all in all, there is quite a substantial difference. How do you feel now you're lying down in here? Well, since I've been lying down here, I've been, with my eyes closed, I've been, been seeing flashes either side of my eyes, almost like there's lightning on the horizon. Um, and I'm starting to feel quite sleepy as well, quite dreamy. Is it pleasant or unpleasant? or? It's pleasant, yeah, it's pleasant lying down. And, um, and, and, and the lights on either side of my eyes are, uh, uh, yeah, they're quite nice. It's, it's quite enjoyable with your eyes closed. The, the only bad thing is, is my mouth is just so awfully dry. It feels like an ashtray. Are you warmer? Is your temperature warmer? Yes, it is actually. Yeah. Well, you do lose the ability to sweat, which does tend to increase the uh, temperature somewhat. Oh, OK. Jim and Paul were increasingly confused and drowsy. Soon they would need to rest. So we rapidly investigated Jim's strange sensation of falling. I don't feel as if I'm falling onto the back of my heels, like, like I usually do when I'm standing on the ground. I'm, I'm, I'm tipping forward, almost as if I'm on, on the slope of a hill. I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm trying to compensate. Right, that'd be OK. You can get off now. Before you took the henbane, we had a fairly random pattern here, sort of movement in all directions generally rather than just in one direction and now this is the after one and look it's really quite different instead of it being fairly random motion we've got movement mainly forward and then obviously you're trying to compensate and moving back again 
So we've got a more forward and backward motion here than this random here. So that's really quite a significant difference, and it bears out what you thought. Five hours in, Liz just managed to finish her last tests before the volunteers became too sedated to carry on. She found that even at the low dose we had used, there was a marked change in pupil size. So at much higher doses, henbane could potentially increase night vision. The volunteers could now rest and undergo the strongest stage of the experience. They would enter a strange twilight zone, neither sleeping nor awake, and it's during this phase of Henbane's effects that hallucinations are said to occur. At this crucial point in the experiment, we would have no access to their thoughts. Would they see visions? Would they experience spirit flight? It was with a sense of anticipation that Paul and Diane roused our volunteers. At first they were disorientated and had difficulty in describing their experiences clearly. Tell me a bit about what's been happening while you've been playing here. Well, I've just been really dozing. I'm still, I'm still getting light pulses. Light pulses? At the corner of my eyes. It was, it, it was it was just a, a pure light show. There was um. There wasn't even a, there was no emotion even attached to it. Right. It was just a, a black and white light show. Right. It was very relaxing though. Sort of um, visuals of again moving over landscapes and so on, seeing uh, mushroom shaped plants. Paul began to describe experiences of aerial flight and seeing landscapes from above. Sort of aerial. There have been lots of different ones, but um, that was um, memorable again because it's something I have seen often before in other experiences mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. with this plant. So it was interesting to see that, that it's still there, that you I could do get this um, sensation of looking from above down onto things, right. and very often that they're organic things, plants, trees, mm -hmm. hills, and mm -hmm. things like that. So that was, that was worthwhile. Eager to find out more, Paul and Diane took the volunteers outside for some fresh air. Now alert, they were able to describe more clearly what had happened. Well, when I was lying down, I had uh, a very vivid dream-like state. Um, the difference between a dream was that I felt I was in control. And I would be lying on the bed and as I would, in my mind, run through the events of the day, I would be able to see them very clearly mm -hmm. and be able to look at notepads, look at people's faces, go through dialogues that they had and so on. And uh, once I'd gone through most of the things that concerned me over the day, or that's stuck in my mind the most. Not only did Paul Russo describe vivid pictures, he also elaborated on his flying experience. I was then able to just sort of let my body drift off and relax a bit more into it. And in that later phase, I really felt like I was floating over landscapes. I could again have this aerial perspective of looking down onto things. Mm. But at the same time, very vivid, very realistic three-dimensional imagery but I was distant, distanced from it. I wasn't really involved with it. I was just, as if I was watching a uh, motion picture. So it was like somewhere. having a vivid dream, but without being asleep, and you're still aware that you were conscious and that you were... That's um, right. Yeah. And your body's very relaxed, um, yeah. and just literally almost asleep. So it was like you were physically asleep, but mentally awake. That's right. Mm. And uh, very accurate, like I'd be able to zoom in on notepads and things like that really? as well. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, it was quite useful. Very good, very interesting. Not bad for a low dose, really. No, I know. Yeah, quite useful. Very good. Yeah. After a final physical examination, the volunteers went back to sleep. Reports of spirit flight are often the result of near-death doses. But even at the low dose we had used, there had been marked physiological and mental effects. So what more would the volunteers have to tell us the next day? And was it really true that witches would have risked their lives to seek Henbane's powerful vision?
I'm sure there must be deep significance. So, so I didn't eat the egg and I, and I went off. On the morning of the third day, our volunteers joined us for breakfast. They seemed to be fully recovered from the effects of the henbane. Well, you two, thank you very much for all you've done, and sorry to have subjected you to all these rather bizarre things that we have done. How are you feeling afterwards? I feel very rested after my sleep. Mm -hmm. and, and I had dreams. Mm -hmm. Paul, how about you? Well, this morning when I woke up, my pupils were still very dilated, more so than yesterday even. Mm -hmm. So that took me by surprise. I had a very, very deep and peaceful sleep. I do get this um, sensation of looking from above down onto things. Right. And very often that they'll get... In the library, we viewed clips of the previous day's experiment. Might the vivid scenes and aerial views that Paul had experienced relate to accounts of witchcraft? Clearly, they hadn't been ordinary dreams. The difference between that and a dream state is I feel I'm much more in control when I was on the henbane. Um, I didn't feel like I was on a roller coaster and the images were just happening around me. I really felt like as I thought about something, it became more real, quite vivid, and I could actually watch it. So there was it's slightly different to dreaming. It's, it's like being awake while you're dreaming. And do you see new things when you look for new things and as, as you... Uh, as you, as it were, interrogate your experience, you become aware of different aspects of it. Yes, I think it's, that's exactly how it works. Um, sometimes you see things that you are expecting to see that you might be thinking about, but at the other time you also give it taken by surprise. There really are often things that you don't expect to see and you suddenly see them. Yes. And I think that's really the real reward of an experience like this, is to see the unexpected, yes. something new and different. Yes. Paul, this is an interesting sort of half-waking state. Yes, it's typical of trance states and visions. And also what you said about the novelty of some of the scenery you see or the, the images that you see, they don't seem to come from your own memory. They seem to have an autonomous quality, uh, quite different really to normal dreams and your memories and reflections and so on. So Liz, what's behind this sort of half-waking, half-dreaming uh, state? Well, these plants are well known for inducing this kind of twilight sleep, and in fact, it was used as a henbane was used as an aid to childbirth, when it's usually a good idea to not know what's going on. And um, the the chemicals that the alkaloids involved are known do interrupt nervous transmission, so it's quite likely, it's quite um, a reasonable thing to find. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and and I was I was dreaming, but but. We wondered how Jim had coped with this unusual state where the body sleeps but the mind is highly active. Had it been disturbing? No, it wasn't unpleasant. It was, it was something different that I hadn't experienced before. It was, it was, it was a blurred boundary and it was almost like um, it was a surface that I hadn't really got my footing on. So, uh, looking at the video, I looked, I looked quite confused. Um, but I think it was because I didn't quite know how to harness that state that I was in at that at that time, mm -hmm. um, but no, it wasn't it wasn't scary. Mm -hmm. So, what conclusions did my guests draw from our experiment? In addition to the enhanced night vision and the increased blood flow, which might account for erotic tales in witchcraft, Liz felt that she had found some physical basis for flying experiences. Instead of having an amplitude of, of variation in the pressure of people trying to hold their balance after something, we had a, kind, a, a slightly different movement in that um, the subject was moving forwards and backwards rather than just randomly swaying about. And I was surprised at that. But of course he did say that he felt as if he was leaning forward, as if he was about to take off. So, yes, a little, yeah, some corroboration, I would say. Mm -hmm. Not surprisingly, Paul felt this supported his argument for the link between Henbane and historical accounts of witches. The volunteers only took small doses, but we saw clear hints there of uh, visions that had the vividness of video clips. Uh, there were exotic scenes. There was a sense of aerial flight, uh, of aerial perspectives on some of the scenery that was observed. So there were hints with these small doses of the sort of subjective effects that we, we pick up in the literature and in the reports down 
for centuries. But nonetheless, I don't... Diane, however, wasn't convinced. What Paul's just said is very interesting, and it's a very interesting summary. He spoke about exotic landscapes, and he spoke about aerial flight, and those do go very well um, with a certain notion of European witchcraft. The trouble is it was only Paul who experienced those things. And I think that strongly suggests that Paul is influenced in interpreting the drug by his very extensive knowledge of European witchcraft tradition and shamanism. I think he's seeing what he expects to see. Jim, who knew far less about it, is not seeing so much. So I think we can't conclude from this that this drug is the basis of European witchcraft. Well, well at the heart of these experiences are certain as twilight consciousness, sort of between sleep and waking there is a sensation of flight. There's no doubt that these substances do produce that. No question at all. Whoever takes them, wherever they take them, they, they got culturally co colored by whatever they, the society believe in which they're taken. Uh, but you just can't get away from the fact that plants do produce these effects. But you say there's no doubt that this is what people experience wherever they take them and whenever they take them, but Jim didn't experience anything like that. That, I think, is probably due to the dose rate, isn't it, Liz? Well, obviously, we had to be extremely careful with the dose. And what we really gave the subjects was a sort of therapeutic dose, not the kind of toxic dose that we would expect to result in, in these wilder hallucinations and delirium and so forth, which we naturally didn't really want them to. Um, we would have to extrapolate to get to that point. Another reason Diane wasn't convinced the experiment had proved a link between witches and henbane was her belief that hallucinogenic experiences are a recent phenomenon unknown in Western Europe until the discovery of the New World and increased trade. Hallucinogenic substances don't hit Western Europe as ritual or recreational drugs until the 18th century and encounters with cultures such as the Americas cultures, cultures of the Middle East and so forth. Hallucinogenic substances attract hostility in Western culture and one of the reasons that they attract hostility is because they're associated with other cultures, cultures other than our own. On the other hand, nobody minds if you get drunk because alcohol has been part of the Western European scene for thousands of years. Everything you're saying is true for the last 500 years. I'm not so sure it's true for, for earlier history and certainly prehistory in the West. And um, by its very nature, there's not a written documentation of this. I would argue that far from the moment of the witchcraft persecutions being the decline of a hallucinogenic culture, it actually ushers in the era of a hallucinogenic culture. Um, mm. Hallucinogens in Western European society are not extensively used until the late 18th century. They're a product of the Enlightenment, of urbanization, of better transport and no. better trade. From my point of view, it is inconceivable that these plants were used for countless generations for medicinal purposes without their visionary properties being equally well known. The argument moved into the present day, where my guests agreed that modern society is largely hostile to hallucinogenic experiences. But was this because they were new to our culture, or because we had lost their sacred context? In the ritual use of hallucinogen, plant hallucinogens in the past, in a, if you like, in a sacramental context, it was a cohesive factor in the societies. We certainly can see that in anthropological terms. So, whereas we look at drugs today in an official capacity as something that is damaging, eating away at our culture, that is a, a cancer within our society, we can look at, say, simpler tribal peoples who use the same sort of substances, but it actually strengthens their moral codes, it strengthens the social cohesiveness, and, and we must be looking at that sort of fundamental difference. My feeling would be that one of the reasons that drugs are divisive in modern society is because drugs are, relatively speaking, incomers to our society. They've been, as you yourself said, imported along the new trade routes. It's as a result of that importation of drugs into a culture that doesn't, in fact, have a context for yeah. them. I'd agree with that, but you see, this is the point. We're, when we're talking about witchcraft and pre-witchcraft eras, the, the rural uh, traditions of, of early Europe, for example, they weren't flying in cocaine. You know, there were no jumbo jets. Yeah, they so have. they would use their native plants, they and have. they would have a context for those. 
Diane later put forward the idea that societies choose their substances according to economic and cultural needs, and that this determines attitudes towards drugs. Isn't it also the way the culture needs or, or, or doesn't need the substance? Sugar was imported into England from the West Indies, and people were able to lace their tea with it and thus stagger off to do a 12-hour day in the Manchester cotton mills. So it was a drug that Western society could accept because it furthered Western society's economic interests. Tobacco, coffee, tea, they're all useful stimulants and relaxants that make us work more efficiently. Tripping for 10 hours on LSD annoys employers. I'm just wondering whether it's, it, when I say there's not a context, I mean there is no space in our society no, our for the society kind of experience that you're describing. The societies we're, we're talking about. Yeah. And that's yeah. why I, I refer to this period of the witch persecutions as the end of an era. What I think we're seeing with the, the witch persecutions was a sort of almost a drawing a line in the sand, if you like. It was the decline of a rural-based order and the traditions and the skills and the knowledge that went with that. It had been an intriguing experiment. The question of when Western Europeans first discovered hallucinogens would continue to fascinate for it was of fundamental importance to our own culture. I began to prepare for my next and final investigation into a culture far distant from our own and a mysterious flower that could perhaps rewrite history, the blue lily of ancient Egypt. <laughs> 